remembered that you were same sign as me, Aries. Happy birthday. <laughs> All right. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Today's guest is broadcasting all the way from Israel. He wrote a book called The Vegan Revolution, which we're going to talk about today. His name is Dr. Richard Schwartz, and please welcome him back to the show. It's nice to see you again. Oh, great to be on. Many thanks for the opportunity and kudos for the wonderful work you're doing and best wishes for your great continued success. Well, thank you. So tell us, last time you were on the book, you'd ha it, had, it wasn't out yet. So tell us, what is Vegan Revolution? What is it about? What spurred you to write it? Okay, well, as you say, I'm in Israel now, and Israel is the world capital for veganism, highest percent in any other country. So that's uh, part of it. Also, I call it a vegan revolution because it's amazing the, the vast variety of plant-based substitutes for animal products. Some of them have the look, texture, and taste so close to the meat product that people have been eating meat for years and years can't tell the difference. And it's really not just vegan revolution because of what's been happening, but also hopefully a projection for the future because the world really needs a vegan revolution in order to reduce the uh, tremendous uh, variety of life-threatening diseases and in order to reduce the potential for the terrible pandemics like the one we're having right now. And very importantly, the greatest critical, critical threat to the world today is climate change. So we need a vegan revolution, a major shift to vegan-based diets to uh, really save the world and avert a climate catastrophe. Great. Um, uh, Dr. Schwartz, people want to make sure they hear you, so please be as close to the microphone as you can, okay? Okay, we'll do. Okay. That's, yeah. so, so you think that there really is a vegan revolution, not just in Israel? Well, actually, definitely, because especially with the young people, young people are moving there quite a bit. You know, like Greta Thunberg, uh, uh, the young person now, that's still a teenager perhaps, came out very strongly about climate change. And in addition, she became a vegan. And I think the young people are realizing more and more how much their future depends on veganism. They know about the health effects. They know about the terrible ways that animals are treated. And as I mentioned before, that climate change is such a threat. And the young people are realizing that and moving toward veganism. Nice, that's great. <laughs> So part of the subtitle of your book is Saving the World. Why do you think the world needs saving? Well, as I indicated, the world unfortunately is heading toward a climate catastrophe. And it's not just my view. I'm just a one person uh, in between trying to get the message out. But this is the view of 97% of the climate experts, science academies all over the world, and most importantly, thousands of peer-reviewed articles in respected science journals. Now, for example, there's a group called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And it's an in case, intergovernmental climate experts from all over the world. And they come out with a report every few years and recently indicated that unprecedented changes are necessary by 2030 in order to avert a climate catastrophe. And the facts on the ground are reinforcing this. The temperatures have been going up very much. Every single year, 21 years in this century, uh, are all in the top 22. The year 2020 tied 2016 for the warmest year. And uh, because of this, there's melting of polar ice caps, glaciers all over the world, the permafrost. Greenland is melting, they say, beyond the uh, point of no return. And of course, there's been more and more storms, droughts, floods, wildfires, heat waves. So it's definitely a problem and the projections for the future are very dire. There's a potential because of what's called a positive feedback loop where it's like a vicious cycle. For example, every time there's a major event, there's wildfires in California and they've been more and more severe. Of course, many houses are destroyed, many cars are destroyed and uh, to rebuild the houses, new cars, takes a lot of energy, a lot of more greenhouse gases being emitted. And of course, trees that absorb carbon dioxide are destroyed. And instead of absorbing it and burning, they release carbon dioxide. 
So this is the major, major issue facing the world. Major reason I wrote that book and getting so involved in uh, promoting this idea that there's got to be a very strong vegan revolution. Right. Well, how long have you been vegan and what first spurred you to become vegan? Okay, actually I became a vegetarian first in about 1978 and it took a while, but slowly but surely I became a vegan like in the year 2000. So what in, was involved, actually I was teaching mathematics at the College of Staten Island. And one of the courses I was teaching was for liberal arts and science students. They were poorly motivated toward math, poorly prepared, but they had to take one course to meet a degree requirement. It was very hard to motivate them. So I came up with the idea of creating a course called Mathematics and the Environment. Same basic math, probability, statistics, graph sequences, but everything related to the environment. And one year we were discussing world hunger and I was thinking millions of people are dying. It's unfortunate. I guess the world just can't produce enough food. Then I read this wonderful book by Francis Moore Pay, you may be familiar with, Diet for a Small Planet. And she pointed out the wastefulness of animal-based diets, where, for example, in the US, scandalously, 70% of the grain produced is fed to animals, while an estimated, as most recent figures I've seen, 9 million people are dying of hunger and effects every year and over 10% of the world's people are chronically malnourished. Making it even more scandalous, we take very healthy foods like soy and corn and oats, you know, high in complex carbohydrates and fiber and devoid of cholesterol and, and, um, and very strong, okay, devoid of cholesterol and saturated fat. We feed them to the animals, we get just the opposite. No, uh, complex carbohydrates or fiber, very high in cholesterol. So uh, realizing this, having discussions with the students, more and more, uh, after, uh, took my own advice and slowly but surely gave up eating animal products and it's led to me being a vegan now and again, writing this book, many, many articles. By the way, I have 250 articles at a website it's jewishbeige.com and then a slash in my last name, S-C-H-W-A-R-T-Z. So that's a quick story. <laughs> so you became vegan in 19, or vegetarian in 1978. That was a year after I became vegan. How old were you then? Uh, let's see, 1978. All right, maybe tell us how old you are now, if you don't mind, and then I'll do the math. I just had my 87th birthday. So, uh, what saved me, I was born at a very early age and blessed with some very good genetics. My father passed away almost 100, mother in the late 80s. So uh, very happy to be vegan and get this message out because this is essential for the future of humanity. By the way, living in Israel, I've been blessed with uh, four grandchildren getting married, becoming a great grandfather with two great grand children and one more in the way. And because of that, I see more and more the necessity of promoting a vegan diet. I wonder what kind of world are we going to leave for future generations if what's been happening continues. And by the way, the temperature increase has been just about 1.1 degrees Celsius or two degrees Fahrenheit since the beginning of the industrial age. And the projections are as much as not just 1.1, but as much as over three, a, a tripling by the end of the century, it could become almost an unlivable world. So this is something I hope everyone in your wonderful audience will get involved, speak to uh, leaders, religious leaders, uh, educators, and try to get this issue onto the agenda. And by the way, um, so important that you mentioned this, my most recent book here. If anybody contacts me at Veggie Rich, one word, V E G G B E W G I E R I C H at gmail.com, I'll be happy to send complimentary podcasts with that book uh, of the full text and the cover picture. 
So I want to work together as many people as possible. Hopefully it'll start many respectful dialogues and shift, help shift our imperiled planet onto a sustainable path. That's amazingly generous of you. Thank you. I'm, I'll put that in both the show notes and the chat. So guys, email him for the free book. That's amazing. So it sounds like you were in your 40s when you made the switch. And you, you seem like you're in wonderful health now. It's been over 40 years. Well, thank God. Thank God. I'm in a wonderful retirement village here in Israel. Able to go to the gym every morning, the pool, do a park and do some additional exercise. And uh, so... Uh, <laughs> Very thankful for every every single day, and that at eighty seven I can still be active and uh, doing more and more. By the way, as we speak here on uh, April twenty first, tomorrow is Earth Day, and what I'm doing something I think hopefully will be transformative. I have organized what's called a teaching with twenty one very amazing people rabbis, educators, environmentalists, vegetarian activists. So we're gonna have a Zoom event. And uh, if uh, anybody would like to attend that, it's gonna be starting 12.30 US Eastern time. And uh, if they contact me again at veggie rich, uh, B-E-G-G-I-E-R-I-C-H at gmail.com, I'll be happy to send a link to that. It's gonna be an amazing event with uh, really, Amazing, amazing people. Well, thank that's that's great. Thank you. There's a question here from I saw it a second ago from Gabriella about your if your family was also vegan or plant based. <laughs> okay. Well, my wife, thank God, is, and I have um, let's see, one daughter that's a vegan. She goes beyond me. She's like a fruitarian, very little cooked food. And I have two grandchildren that are vegans and one that's a vegetarian. And my, I have another daughter that's not quite a vegetarian, but uh, doesn't have meat during the week. So, uh, it, so as you mentioned, I became a vegetarian in my 40s. So my children were used to eating meat. You know, they didn't grow up as vegetarians. So they indicated, thank God, some have changed, but not all. <laughs> Right. Well, Monica says she's ready for a revolution for saving animals and our human health. And everybody, you can help the revolution. You can get Dr. Schwartz's book for free just by emailing him at veggierich at gmail.com. That link is in the show notes and in the chat. Very great. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So Linda's saying the vegan meat products you're talking about, what are they made with? Because some of them people worry are, are not, even though they're better, they're not optimal. Do you know what I mean? I mean, they're better than eating animals but they're sometimes not the greatest for human health. So what are they made of, Linda wants to know. Okay, well, first of all, the ideal, of course, is fresh fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, legumes, whole grains, etc. cetera. So, uh, and uh, they're organic, locally grown. Uh, so these are, maybe they can be maybe transition food. Some are made of lentils and soy. They are not, you know, all kinds of processed foods are not the healthiest, as you know, as a chef, I'm sure. And all, but uh, uh, so it shouldn't be like the primary source. Again, the uh, uh, unprocessed foods are best, but every once in a while can have some of these, or especially if somebody wants to transition toward vegetarian or even better, a vegan diet. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Angela says, why, why do you think Israel is way ahead on the vegan advancements? Okay, so it's a small country and the message gets out there quite a bit. And I like to believe one major factor, and this is also in my first book, Judaism and Vegetarian, now in the third edition, is that Jewish teachings, the Jewish values are very consistent with vegan diets. And I try to point out there are six major Jewish values, teachings, fundamental teaching that point to veganism as the ideal diet. And very briefly, these are to take care of our health, to treat animals with compassion, to protect the environment, to conserve natural resources, to help hungry people, and to seek and pursue peace. These are all fundamental to Judaism. So I think even though most uh, Jews here, if you're secular, somehow I think maybe those values are getting through to them 
and uh, Israel is also a leader in the uh, plant-based food, so that may be a factor as well. Yeah, terrific. There's a question from Dale. What would Dr. Schwartz say is the most important thing we can do to make a positive difference in our changing world? I'm going to guess it's go vegan. <laughs> well, okay, not only to go vegan, but to help spread that message. What I've been trying to do is send letters to the editors as much as possible. There's so many issues where you can write letters. For example, there's an article about the horrible nature of somebody being killed and coming ill from the pandemic, point out that this pandemic and so many others like swine flu, bird flu, Ebola, MERS and SARS caused by the widespread mistreatment and eating of animals. Or if there's an article about world hunger to point out, as I said before, that it's incredible. That's why I call it the animal-based arts like madness and sheer insanity, that there's so much hunger, so much uh, chronic malnourishment, and how can we feed 7% of the grain in the US to animals to fatten them up in that case? Or there's an article about health to point out that we could reduce the heart disease, so many forms of cancer, other life-threatening diseases, so much by a shift to vegan diet. So there's so many reasons. And of course, anybody concerned about animals, uh, the way that animals are treated is just incredible. They say these are all inconsistent with Jewish values, they're inconsistent with all religion values because every religion is based on compassion and sharing and justice and mercy, etc. So not only become a vegan, but become a vegan activist. Be always respectful. And uh, there's so much on the internet to learn. I mentioned I have 250 articles. By the way, I have articles relating every single Jewish holiday and the Shabbat, the Sabbath day, to vegetarianism and veganism. And uh, I have questions and answers and uh, book reviews. And again, that's jewishveg.com slash S-C-H-W-A-R-T-Z. I like that you say that all religions are or should be based in compassion. And that's where I first found out about you many years ago was from your book, Judaism and Vegetarianism, which I highly recommend as well. Uh, let's see. Uh, Monica says, what science-based facts can you share with others for your revolution? Okay, well, uh, there are so many peer-reviewed articles in respected medical journals that point to the health benefits of um, plant-based diets. And just a couple of studies I can mention, it's a Dr. Dean Ordish out in California, and he decided to try to see, can we reduce or even reverse heart disease, not with the usual drugs and surgery, but with really shift to plant-based diets along with other lifestyle changes. And, and that occurred uh, uh, an amazing success. People with very severe heart problems uh, were cured 78% uh, in his study uh, by the shift in the diet and other lifestyle changes. And insurance companies that were originally reluctant to use this approach now are very happy to do it because it's very much cheaper than surgery and drugs and it's more long lasting. And in terms of climate change that I've been stressing, as I said, thousands of peer reviewed articles uh, pointing to the fact that climate change is a major threat caused by human beings and uh, that we have to do everything possible to re make sure that uh, we reduce climate change. Yeah. When any questions? It's great. <laughs> yeah. When do revolutions normally start? I'm sorry, when do they start? Yeah, well, I mean, when do they, when, you know, think about like revolutions throughout human history. What, what's usually the tipping point for a revolution? Okay. Well, the tipping point, like I said, now the young people who are getting involved, as you probably know, many of them just uh, left school on Fridays in order to demonstrate to protest and all. So I think it's uh, not too many years ago. You know, it's been slow and steady and all that, but there's been like a, an upsurge, as I say, when the young people realize how their future is so threatened by climate change. 
and recognizing especially how terribly animals are treated, quite contrary, as I mentioned and you repeated, compassion is part of every single religion. So many people are into religion, but uh, you know, if you talk about the great teeth values that religion does have and in effect next door, animals are being retreated, mistreated, there's an inconsistency there. So thankfully the young people and more and more are recognizing this and moving toward veganism and other positive lifestyle changes. Thank you. Uh, why do you think it's important for people of the Jewish faith and really any faith to be vegan? Okay, well, it's essential again, because in order to have a decent world for future generations, and I have another book, by the way, called Who Stole My Religion? And it's very positive on Judaism, and but it indicates that Judaism is a gradual, radical religion in the best sense of the term, with great teachings on compassion and sharing and justice and environmental sustainability, but unfortunately it's not being practiced enough. Now, I should mention there are many Jewish groups and individuals who are doing great things, but uh, the vast majority not doing enough on that. So it's important that Jews be vegans, partly for a better world, partly better for the animals, for their own health, and also to put Jewish values into practice in the best sense. Nice. One of the subtitles of the book is Revitalizing Judaism. Why do you think Judaism needs revitalizing? Well, there too. Judaism is a radical religion. We have some amazing teachings on pursuing justice and pursuing peace, uh, being kind to the stranger. By the way, 36 times in the Torah, the Jewish scriptures that is indicated, and love thy neighbor as thyself. And it indicates, for example, that human beings were put into the Garden of Eden to work the land, but also to protect it. So we have these teachings, and Jews should be. Many are, but uh, not enough, be in the forefront of efforts to re uh, revitalize Judaism and create a better, more just, compassionate, more humane, more peaceful, more environmentally sustainable world. Linda has mentioned in the chat that it's a lot easier keeping kosher when you're vegan. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, because uh, you don't have to have the two sets of dishes, worry about missing meat and milk. And one important thing about that, I discussed this a little bit in the book, there have been unfortunately many scandals in the kosher meat industry. You know, when you have uh, millions of uh, stores all over, kosher supervision, I'm sure most kosher supervisors are very ethical, but there's always a chance of making a mistake. And uh, just in a kitchen where every day of the year, year after year, people have meat and milk, which of course, according to kosher laws, can't be mixed and all other things. It's very easy for a mistake to be made. So it's much easier, less expensive. You don't need two sets of dishes and silverware for everyday use and also additional two sets for Pesach. That's a very good point. Uh, there's so many points that point to veganism as an idea of Jews and for everybody else. Great, thank you. Let's see, I saw a question from Devorah. How do you find enough quality food to eat in Israel during and immediately after Shemitah? Oh, she didn't find enough quality food to eat, she's saying? I don't even know what Shemitah is, to be honest, and I'm Jewish. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Well, Shemitah is, it means a sabbatical year. Every, in the Torah, it indicated every seven year, the land had to be laid fallow and to recover, and that people and animals would be free to just eat uh, from that food. And that's something we need today, in a sense. You know, we can't have it exactly that way, but... We need Shemitah like a rest for the land and a rest for people because we're moving ahead, full speed ahead, and uh, it's causing so many environmental problems to all. So uh, again, there's such a wide variety of fruits and vegetables in Israel. And I, I don't think in the Shemitah year uh, that would be diminished that much. Uh, not, not every farmer observes that nowadays. They do try to have some uh, indications of the biblical teaching on that, but just in general, uh, there's many great fruits and vegetables in Israel. That's great. 
So here's an interesting question from Rhiannon asking as a Christian, does the Jewish faith believe that Adam and Eve were vegans? I assume so. I offer, I often share this with other critical Christians. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Because it's right there in the very first chapter of the Torah, chapter one, verse 29, God's first dietary regimen, strictly vegan, talks about the herbs of the field and the fruits of the trees, etc. It wasn't until the time of Noah, you know, with Noah and the flood, that God gave a reluctant permission for people to eat meat. Some feel it, it was, you know, the people had such a lust for meat that cannibalism might occur. So permission was given. So the important thing today is that permission was given at that time, but that means that Jews have a choice. We're not, so we must eat meat. So Jews have a choice, everybody else has a choice. So the thing is, shouldn't that choice be made, taking into account the highest of Jewish values, the highest of all religion values? Again, to take care of our health to treat animals with compassion, preserve the environment, conserve natural resources, help hungry people, seek and pursue peace, fundamental teachings of every religion. So you have Adam and Eve, were vegetarian, and that's the beginning, the first chapter, as I mentioned. According to Jewish tradition, the, the other ideal time to come, or in effect to go back to the idea of Garden of Eden, is what Jews yearn for the Messianic period. And that will also be begin according to Rabbi Abraham Isaac Cohen Cook, the first chief rabbi of chief of Peace State Israel. And he based that on the powerful prophecy of the prophet Isaiah that in that ideal time, the wolf will dwell with the lamb, the lion will destroy the ox, no one shall hurt nor destroy in all of God's holy mountain. So that is seized as a peaceable kingdom that again will be vegan. Wow, thank you. Uh, Yenta Vegan says, thank you for being a force for good in this world. I'm a kosher vegan. I feel closer to Hashem by following this lifestyle, Yashikoach. You know, I was thinking I had Dr not doctor, uh, Rabbi Shmuley on the show. And you talked about revitalizing Judaism. Some of their uh, customs, if you will, are very cruel to animals. So you might be referring to- um, Kaparot, for example. Right, right. Well, that is practiced by a relatively small number of people. Uh, I discuss that in the book and all. And there are Jews and others that are trying to change that. By the way, Kaparot, uh, right be between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, that can be practiced not by swinging the chickens over the head and killing the chickens, but by the donation of money. So that's what we're pushing that, you know, it's like symbolically shifting sins away and all, and it can be done in other ways. So uh, it's unfortunate that uh, some, even I mentioned, uh, vegan the capital of the world, but still the vast majority of Jews eat meat and uh, some wear fur coats and all. But uh, the main emphasis in Judaism, for Kutzar, Bar Chaim, the uh, prohibition of causing cruelty to animals, and it's again, very powerful teaching. It's part of the Ten Commandments, by the way, that you know, the most holy part of the Bible that indicates that not only are people to rest on the Sabbath day, but animals as well. And the Jew is not even to sit down to his or her own meal without making sure that if they have a pet, that the pet is fed first or a farm animal, that that animal is fed first. And there's much in the Torah about not yoking uh, a strong and a weak animal, not mucking wing an ox while threshing in the field. So the very powerful teachings in Judaism. And that's one of the things I'm trying to do, by the way. There was an ancient new year for animals that involved tithing for sacrifices. So I'm trying, along with others, to renew that ancient holiday, but to transform it into a day devoted to increasing awareness of Judaism, powerful teachings on compassion for animals, and how far the realities are from that today. And there's a precedent there with what's called Tubish Bat, another ancient Jewish holiday, a new year for trees that's been revived and is becoming more and more popular. Wow, great. Well, I mean, the kosher slaughter of animals to me is not necessarily any less painful or humane than the way it's done in factory farms. Do you think it's 
Do, do you agree with that? <laughs> well, actually, Shkita, which is Jewish culture fraud, was designed to minimize pain. And uh, for example, in the factory farms, there's a tremendous turnover. Very often, it's immigrants desperate for work who uh, become slaughterers. And there's the most rapid turnover in the non Jewish slaughterhouses. So a pious person has to be the person, uh, the, the so-called shohet or slaughterer, saying a special blessing. But unfortunately, because today it's such a mass production situation that the uh, kosher slaughter, the shechita is not carried out in the ideal way. There have been abuses. So as president emeritus of Jewish veg, and that group, we oppose all kinds of slaughter, but we do oppose shechita when it's singled out. There's a wonderful book by Gail Eisner called Slaughterhouse, which points out the very horrible conditions, you know, and they try to stun the animals off and it doesn't work and horrible things happen. So shechita was designed to minimize pain, but uh, often doesn't work ideally because of the Tremendous speed in modern um, factory farming. Great, thank you. Linda says uh, she feels that being vegan aligns better with the Torah and kindness. And okay. Susan says, Dr. Schwartz is amazing. He's done so much for veganism. I've seen him speak before, powerful message. And several people watching said they actually saw you speak at Vegetarian Summerfest in 2005 and you arranged a Shabbat dinner while you were there. Oh yeah, you always love that. Uh, I mean, out of my history, of course, I can't attend that, but I used to, and a uh, wonderful, wonderful occasion. And yep, uh, 2005, it goes back. By the way, that group, the Summerfest, North American Vegetarian Society, I think it was 2008, perhaps, they inducted me into their so called, then it was a Vegetarian Hall of Fame, I think now it's called a Vegan Hall of Fame. So yeah. it's a wonderful, wonderful group, and I really enjoyed speaking there. So I'm glad. Some people remember that. And, uh, I didn't I didn't realize you were a past winner. I have my award on the wall. I won it in 2018. Mm -hmm. Mazel tov. That's great. It's well, great to be in company with you. Well, same here. Thank you. Yeah. What, so uh, I, here's a question from Barbara. Can you explain what the word that is usually translated as dominion means in Genesis? <laughs> okay. Actually, that... The chapter one of Genesis, that is one of the things that's been in, misinterpreted to a tremendous extent with very harmful effects. Dominion does not mean to find, uh, do, do whatever you want. That is interpreted by the sages as responsible stewardship. And some of the proofs after that, I think that's uh, uh, chapter one, verse 26 or so in the Torah, shortly after that, that chapter one, verse 26, in a couple of verses right after that, chapter one, verse 29, we are forbidden to eat animals that uh, we mentioned before, that strictly vegan, uh, vegetarian dietary regimen was established. And shortly after that, chapter two, Verse 15, as I mentioned, the human being was put in the Garden of Eden, God of Eden, in order to work the land, but also to protect it. So again, the important thing is some people are taking dominion, which says, you know, we have dominion over animals, so caught blinds, do whatever you want, but it's really just the opposite. It's just like a mother has dominion over baby, but of course that uh, doesn't give the mother the right to mistreat the baby. Or if you hire a gardener, they're given that garden of dominion. They're the expert. They know when to fertilize, when to seed, when to prune the trees. Uh, so you're given that the garden of dominion over your garden, but certainly that is responsible stewardship to protect it and not to uh, abuse it. Right. Thank you. Rowie Katz says, this is a cool interview. I used Dr. Schwartz's Judaism and Vegetarianism book back around 1997 for my Rabbinic's midterm and making vegan tefillin, a short story, if the Mishnah specifies leather is the only kosher material out of which to make tefillin, then let's wait till we can custom print leather. <laughs> yeah, I think Judaism needs an update, especially if they want more people to join because it's... Okay, well, the ideal thing, by the way, in terms of tefillin, for example, is for what they call hitor mitzvah, to enhance the mitzvah. That leather should come from an animal 
that was not mistreated and died a natural death. So that would be like um, uh, hindering the Jewish tradition. But of course, uh, when the Torah was given, the Jews were um, farming people, you know, uh, shepherds and everything. So that's uh, what happened there. So the, uh, the ideal would be, again, if that can be rather made from uh, another source and all, but, it, but if it could be from animals, the ideal that were not cruelly treated by the natural death. Unfortunately, the industry, uh, that wouldn't be profitable for them. So that unfortunately has not been happening. Wow. Well, you know, they're going to be able to do everything soon. Grow meat. They grow meat in the lab, so they probably could grow leather. So would that be acceptable once they start doing that? Um, so far, it's just leather from the animals. Uh, it's, it's so, <laughs> well, I hope, as well, I said, he hasn't had such strong teachings on compassion for animals that if people become more aware of it, if we can get that uh, new year for animals reestablished, get that message out that unfortunately there's so much in the Torah because they were a uh, people on the land farming and all about uh, which animals can be eaten, how they can be killed and all, and about the sacrifice. But hopefully that will change. Maybe uh, it will change in the future. But right now it's uh, only from animals. But ideally, maybe it can be from um, stone passed on from others or used stone or something like that. So minimize it. But the amount involved there is so small compared to the billions of animals that are killed for the food. So that is another factor. Well, you know, sometimes things are put in place because the world is a certain way. And now these things don't, they're not existing right now. So I think it really needs an upgrade because some of their teachings are just archaic in today's world. Well, again, that's why I'm trying to restore and transform that ancient New Year for animals. That's why I'm writing my books, all the articles, to try to indicate that Judaism has such powerful teachings and to have new traditions, like, as I said, that New Year for Animals, and to increase awareness through the teaching that I mentioned coming up, and to get people to recognize that, this is one of the uh, questions mentioned, that veganism is the ideal for Judaism, most consistent with Jewish values, and uh, trying to get the rabbis to recognize this. You know, the rabbis are the most dedicated people doing it all they can to get Jews more involved in religion, but somehow uh, with many great exceptions, but still too few, rabbis not speaking out enough on it maybe because so many of the congregants are so involved in the eating of meat. Yeah, that's, that's a shame. <laughs> So uh, Mullen says, how would Dr. Schwartz approach to those people who dogmatically and blindly insist that God put animals on this earth as food for people and animals also need to be sacrificed in ceremonies? Sacrifice how? In ceremonies. I, I, they're still doing that? Oh my. No, 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 no. After the temples was destroyed in the 70 in the common era, there's no more animal sacrifices it is mentioned in the prayers and all. So when that happened, rabbis indicated that could be great substitutes in terms of prayer, especially doing good deeds and uh, you know uh, repentance and things like that. Um, you know, in terms of the people who are saying that God put the animals here, first you have to take into account again the first very first chapter of Genesis chapter 1, verse 29, God's original intention was that people should be vegans. And there was reluctant permission. Some think, by the way, you know, after the exodus from Egypt, when the Jews, the Israelites were in the desert for 40 years, there was another vegan approach. That was in the miraculous one of the manna from heaven, said in the Bible to be like coriander seed, having whatever taste the people like the best, something like Modern soy, you know, can be converted into a, uh, a veggie burger or even a uh, called a uh, cheese kind of cake, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So again, God's first intention 
that people be vegetarian, permission giving very reluctantly. Uh, but again, we have a choice and the Jewish values point to that choice being that you should be vegan. Yeah, you, you know, I have an idea. Why don't we re revitalize the 10 commandments and made number 11, thou shalt not eat, wear, or experiment on animals. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm all for that. And uh, it may not be part of the commandments, but it is consistent with Jewish values. Again, when there are so many great substitutes and people can be well malnourished, maybe there were times in history where because of flooding or whatever, it wasn't available, the plant-based nutrients and people had to eat meat possibly. But today, there's so many great choices. You go to supermarkets, the health food stores, uh, any local markets and so many fruits and vegetables in such great abundance, uh, such sweet tasting and, and all. And it's time to break that habit that's one of the main reasons people continue to eat meat. The parents serve the same, the grandparents, they're doing it automatically. But when people move to this vegan diet, they some of them feel better. Just uh, I had just this past Sunday, birthday party for my first grandchild, a two year old birthday party. And there was a grandfather there that just became vegan. He had all kinds of trouble health wise and, well, everything was not working. And finally, one doctor suggested he shift to vegan diet. And he said he feels so much better now. He lost 10 kilos, which is 22 pounds. And there's so many cases like that where people have restored their health and all. But I'm here in a retirement village. And unfortunately, every day in the dining room, they have beef and chicken and fish, food with plenty of oil. And uh, unfortunately, uh, things almost every other day we hear of somebody that's in a hospital for somebody for a change in a heart stent, somebody's fallen. So it's madness and sheer insanity. We can have a much healthier world, much more compassionate, environmental, sustainable world on a vegan diet. Great. Yeah, when you were talking about dominion, Karen said it means stewardship. I kind of like that uh, definition. So, I mean, in, in the kosher laws in Judaism, they already have the idea to tell their the people of their faith not to eat certain things like, like pigs, for example, or shellfish. Why couldn't they just go a step further and just say all of it? <laughs> well, absolutely. Some question before asked, how come in Israel was way ahead? I mentioned some reasons, but I forgot to mention this very point, the fact that the kosher laws already have people realizing that there are limitations on what they can eat. No pigs, no shellfish, etc., and not mixing. So, so that is a fact. Well, I agree 100% that that is a step forward and all, and again, would be most consistent. And that's why it's, uh, it's so made us insanity, sheer insanity that people have the animals to base time with so many negative effects. The, the, the negative health effect is an epidemic of disease out there. And the terrible pandemic now caused again by widespread mistreatment and eating of animals. And uh, another factor, by the way, is that animal based diets and agriculture are so wasteful of resources. You need so much more water and energy and land and so much grain again wasted fed to animals rather than people. It takes as much as 13 times as much water per person on an animal-based diet than on a plant-based diet. So there's so many reasons for this and I hope people will contact me if they want to get that uh, complimentary PDFs of my book. If they want to help get involved, again, veggierich at gmail.com. And I agree, and you have been, you know, I've been in many, many programs, but I never saw an audience with so many great questions. So uh, this is a great compliment to your wonderful yeah. program. No, really, and there are a few more in the chat that I certainly can answer, like, for example, the one from Diane, why did God put animals on earth, like the cow, for example? Well, not for us to eat them, but again, it's part of a wonderful world. And uh, think of how boring it would be if we only had people on this world. People love animals, they love pets. And again, it's part of an overall ecosystem. And of course, I just saw here at my retirement village, 
movie, I think, called Extinction, the fact that not only are animals becoming extinct at such a high rate, this is like the sixth extinction, they call it. And uh, this is the first one that is really caused by humans. Others caused by a meteorite hitting the earth or tremendous volcanic action, perhaps, and all. So it's a much greater world with all these animals, but uh, certainly eating them is so negative on our health. And by the way, one of the reasons for that is human beings are biologically are much closer to herbivorous animals than to carnivorous animals. You know, in terms, we don't have the sharp dagger-like teeth of a lion or a tiger or another carnivorous animal. We don't have the claws. You know, we have hands great for picking an orange, an apple, a potato. And we have a long intestinal system uh, very different from uh, carnivorous animals that have a short, direct one. And our stomach has is only 120th as strong as that of carnivorous animals. So the problem is that human beings are close to herbivorous animals, but unfortunately for most people, their diet is not herbivorous, but omnivorous. And that's causing this epidemic of uh, chronic life-threatening diseases. You were the, one of the associate producers on the documentary, A Sacred Duty. Is that somewhere that people can see that if they haven't seen it? Oh yeah, this is a wonderful, wonderful documentary. Came out in Israel in 2007. Yeah, people go to a sacred duty, one word, a sacredduty.com. They can see it. Or if they go to YouTube and do a search, they can see it. And uh, that was produced by a multi-award producer, Lionel Freeberg, who did it as a labor of love and dedication, not one penny of professional fee. And we've given out over 40,000 copies because the message is so strong on that. And I think it's more relevant than ever before. So I strongly suggest that people go to like sacredduty.com and see that movie. It's exactly one hour and it, it uh, reinforces many, if not all, of the message I've been trying to bring out in this wonderful interview. All right. Hey, uh, Lewis said he got his tefillin pre-owned. That is a great idea. Sure, sure. And you don't have to... Yeah. Uh, that. I love that. So here's a question from Monica, or Manica, excuse me. Are there any cultures you can speak on that currently are vegan by nature? Well, um, you know, in some religions, like in India, I mentioned Israel is the world capital of veganism, but in India, there's a much higher percent of vegetarians, but they, many of them are very much into dairy products, so they're not vegans. So there are religions like the Jains, many in India that are much into that, and there probably are some small cultures in different parts of the world that are vegan. So uh, I suggest doing a... Google search, an internet search to find out more on that. Yeah. Jeffrey says, why do people say they love animals so much, yet do not think twice or give a thought about eating them? Why the disconnect? Yeah, I, I mean, that was one of the very first things. I mean, once somebody said to me that exact same thing, Jeffrey, if you love your dog so much, why are you eating that animal? I literally like the next moment became vegan. Like, you're right. Like, mm. Yeah, well, I have a sign right out from my door with that exact point. It says, if you love animals, stop eating them, go vegan. And uh, somebody wrote a wonderful book. I think it was, why do we pet dogs uh, while we... Uh, well, uh, why do we love dogs, wear cows, and eat pigs? Melanie, Melanie okay. Joy, Dr. Joy was on the show in February. Yep, yeah, very good, wonderful. I just want to thank uh, Angela Roberts for her kind super chat donation. Thank you so much. Wow. I, I just, I can't imagine what it's like in Israel uh, with, with such a huge vegan community. I don't know if I'll ever get there, but it sounds amazing. Oh, well, you're welcome. And you have a standing invitation to visit me at my retirement community. If you ever get there in Israel and uh, be happy to treat you a vegan lunch in the dining room. They like said they have all kinds of beef and fish and chicken, but they do have a section with a lot of great vegan food. And that sounds great. Any any final thoughts on veganism, <laughs> vegan activism, how 
we can support your work. I know that you're generously offering your book and I'm putting that not only in the chat, but in the show notes so that anybody that sees this at any time will be able to get a PDF of the book. And I hope everybody watching today will simply email Dr. Schwartz for that. Well, I just want to thank you so much for this opportunity to wish you continued success and to urge everybody in this audience, this is the most critical issue again, climate change, that if we don't address that and solve it, then uh, what kind of world are we gonna have for future generations? How will we answer future generations when they ask, why don't we take action when we could and all? And uh, so I urge everybody to get involved because uh, somebody said, there's no planet B, that's the only world we have is threatened as never before. And uh, we have a wonderful audience, wonderful questions. I urge people, write letters, get involved, speak out, get involved with more and more uh, people, talk to everybody, always be respectful and get the message out. And please feel free to contact me and let's all work together for a better world. Wow, well, thank you so much for your contribution to, to the better world, Dr. Schwartz. I really appreciate it. And thank you as well for your contributions. My pleasure. That's so cool to know that we're both in the Hall of Fame for veganism. I didn't realize. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you so much. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when my guest is Dr. Sarisha Potler. She is going to be cooking oil-free Indian food. That's probably something you don't get very often in Israel, is it? Uh, I'm sorry. But... Indian food, because my guest tomorrow is a physician that's Indian and she's going to make oil-free Indian food. I'm wondering if you ever get that in Israel. <laughs> Sure, there are restaurants and uh, Indian vegetarian vegan food. You know, people in Israel they come from all over the world and uh, from many, many different cultures, and it's a great melting place. Right. Well, shalom. <laughs> shalom from Israel, and best wishes for continued success. Thank you. <laughs>